Welcome to the Physics Classroom's video tutorial on circular and satellite motion. The topic of this video is the centripetal force requirement. And we want to know what is meant by centripetal force and why does the net force on an object moving in a circle have an inward direction. I'm Mr. H. Let's get started. In a previous video, this one, I discussed the direction of the velocity and acceleration vectors for an object moving in a circle. You'll find the link to the video in the description section of this one if you need to review it. Here's what we need to know. Accelerating objects are objects that are changing their velocity, and velocity is a vector that has a magnitude and direction. At any given instant in time, the velocity's magnitude is simply the speed, and the direction is whichever direction the object is moving. Objects that are moving in a circle are are constantly changing their direction and as such they are accelerating even if they never speed up nor slow down because they're changing the direction of the velocity. Here is a top view of the car moving in a circle. You'll notice vectors placed on the car at various locations around the perimeter of the circle. The blue vectors represent the velocity vector. You'll note that they're directed tangent to the circle. The green vectors represent the acceleration vectors. They're directed towards the center of the circle. We refer to this as an inwards acceleration. To understand why objects move in circles, you need to understand Newton's second law of motion, a law most often associated with the equation A equal F net over M. But the law goes much more beyond that. The law would assert that an unbalanced force or a net force would cause an object to accelerate, and the direction of the acceleration is always in the same direction as the net force. But what's confusing is that the direction of the net force is not always in the same direction as the velocity vector. Let's consider three situations. In the first, the object's moving eastward. That's the direction of the velocity vector. And the net force is also directed eastward, so the acceleration is eastward. In this case of the force in the same direction as the motion, the object would speed up. In our second case, the object's moving eastward again, but the net force is directed westward against the motion. Thus, the acceleration must also be westward. In this case of the force going against the motion of the object, the object would slow down. In our final case, the force is directed southward on an object that's moving eastward. In a case such as this, the acceleration would be southward. The object would neither speed up nor slow down, but would turn and begin to make a circle. Newton's first law provides further clues to understanding what must happen for an object to move in a circle. In the absence of an unbalanced or net force, an object keeps on doing whatever it's doing. If the object is moving, it would continue moving with the same speed and in the same direction. Here is a circle, at least part of a circle, with a center marked, and here's an object at the 12 o'clock position. This object, in the absence of any force, would travel tangent to the circle along the dotted line and end up in the position shown by the hollowed out circle. But if there were a force directed inwards towards the center of the circle, the object would follow the circular path and would end up at the one o'clock position. And from that position, again without an unbalanced force, the object would follow a straight line path and end up in the position shown. What you need to get it going along the circular path is an inward force directed towards the center that would allow the object to end up at the two o'clock position. Again, at the two o'clock position, it would travel tangent to the circle in the absence of any force and end up in the location shown, but with an inward net force that would push the object inwards towards the circular path and it would end up at the three o'clock position. The point here is that without a force, an object follows a straight line path and travels away from the center of the circle. To get an object to travel along a circular path, you need an inward force directed towards the circle's center. This demonstration involves a glass marble rolling along the inside of an aluminum pie tin. The wall of the pie tin pushes inward upon the marble with a normal force allowing it to travel along its circular path. But at the 11 o'clock position, a hole has been cut in the wall of the pie tin. No more inward force and no more circular motion. The marble flies out tangent to the circle and inward force is required to maintain a circular path. 
So a net inward force is required in order for an object to travel along a circular path. Without this inward force, an object would travel along a straight line path tangent to the circle. This is known as the centripetal force requirement. Here, the word centripetal means towards the center, center seeking, or inwards. Let me give three examples. In the first example, a rope is tied to a bucket of water and whirled in a circle in a horizontal plane. What force meets the centripetal force requirement? The answer is the force of the rope pulling on the bucket. It's an inward tension force that meets the centripetal force requirement. In the second example, a car makes a, hor makes a circular turn in a horizontal plane. What force meets the centripetal force requirement? And the answer is, it's the force of friction. Once the wheels turn, friction acts inwards up on the car to push it along a circular path. On an icy day, the car would travel tangent to the circle without the friction acting upon it. In the last example, what force acts centripetally up on the moon to cause it to orbit the Earth in a near circular path? The answer is the force of gravity acts on the moon, pulling it inwards at all points along its path so that it can travel in a circle. Now let's consider a bucket filled with water and tied to a rope on one of its ends and held by a person on the other end. The bucket is then whirled in a circle in a vertical plane, and the tension in the rope pulls the bucket inwards at all points along its path. Here we see a vector diagram showing both the force of tension in green and the velocity vectors in blue. The force of tension is not the only force acting upon the bucket, but it is the one force that always acts centripetally. There's also the force of gravity, which acts downwards in all situations and would be only towards the center at the 12 o'clock position along the circle. The force of gravity is what slows the bucket down as it rises from the bottom of the loop up to the top and speeds the bucket up as it travels from the top of the loop to the bottom. But the force of tension acts inwards and can meet the centripetal force requirement. Let's consider two locations along the perimeter of that circle. First, the top of the loop. At the top of the loop, the two forces that act up on it are both acting downwards, gravity and tension, and they're both acting towards the center of the circle. They each supply some force to meet the centripetal force requirement. But at the bottom of the loop, the tension force acts upwards towards the, the center of the circle, but the gravity force acts outwards away from the center of the circle. For this reason, the tension force must be much greater than the gravity force so that there's net inward force. Now let's consider the top of the loop again. At the top of the loop, tension tends to be rather small because first, the bucket's not moving very fast and there's not as much net inward force required. And second, gravity already supplies some of the net inward force and so tension has to provide very little of it. At the bottom of the loop, on the other hand, tension must be very, very great because it must overcome gravity and meet the centripetal force requirement for the bucket to continue in the circle at the bottom of the loop. So you might be wondering why this centripetal force does not change the speed of the object since that's what forces usually do, cause objects to speed up or slow down. The fact is that object speeds will only change when there's a component of force in the same or opposite direction that the object is moving. For instance, here the force is in the same direction that the object moves, so the object speeds up. Here the force is in the opposite direction that the object moves, so the object slows down. Here there's a component of force both vertically and horizontally. It's the horizontal component that would cause the object to speed up since it's in the same direction of motion. And here here, there's still a horizontal and vertical component with a smaller horizontal component causing a smaller amount of speeding up. And in our final example, the force is directed perpendicular to the motion, and in this case, that force cannot cause this object to speed up or slow down. So as long as the force is perpendicular to the direction of motion, it will not cause a speeding up or slowing down, but only a changing of direction. 
We will use this animation to summarize what we've learned about circular motion. For an object moving in a circle, there's a tangential velocity as illustrated by the blue arrow. There's an inward net force to meet the centripetal force requirement to prevent the object from traveling tangent to the circle and away from its center and instead to travel along the circular path. According to Newton's second law, the acceleration is in the same direction as the net force towards the center of the circle. It's at this time in every video that I like to help you out with an action plan, a series of next steps for making the learning stick. But before I help you out, could you help us out by giving us a like, subscribing to the channel, or leaving a question or comment in the comment section below. Now for your action plan. Here are four resources you'll find on our website. I've left links to each in the description of this video. There's a Minds on Physics mission and a concept builder that provide great conceptual reasoning exercises. There's an interactive active simulation that allows you to explore variables, and finally, there's a written tutorial page. Whatever you do, I wish you the best of luck. I'm Mr. H, and I thank you for watching.